Welcome to the Dripping Springs ISD Parent University. In this edition, filmed live at the DSHS Lecture Hall on September 28, 2022, we're joined by Dr. Rich Gilman, president of Terrace Metrics, talking about the pressures of perfectionism and how parents can help. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be very transparent. A lot of my, to my topics are about you and me and less about our students. They're going to learn what, you know, how we kind of do. So I'm going to give you some 30,000 foot view, but always feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to give you studies if you're interested in that, further information, anything you want. And so it's Rich Gilman, G-I-L-M-A-N, at terracemetrics.org. And uh, I'll give you that at the end as well. You can always reach out to me and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So let's go ahead and get started. This whole concept of perfectionism, it's been around. It's been around for a long time, but I got to give you some apologies up in advance. Look, many of my slides are really busy. There's a lot of stuff to read. I'm not going to cover everything on a slide. Um, and it's okay <laughs> to ignore what is up there. And by the way, so prepare for an imperfect presentation. Did you see what I did? I, I actually flipped. Did you see that? That's very funny, isn't it? This is what happens after I wake up at four in the morning and fly here. My humor is just completely off, so <laughs> my apologies. I'm from Cincinnati myself. You from, anybody been to Cincinnati? Go Bengals? All right, I can only go so far with that. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about this idea. There are tons of books and they're continued to come out and then of course it makes sense, right? What, uh, what I'm pointing out is some things in bold print that is often a, a common pattern through our publications. And it's the idea that what we do is not quite good enough. It's never good enough. No matter how we try, it's never going to meet our standards. And so because of that, there's this enormous pressure to succeed in many cases. Now, whether that's an external expectation placed on us or whether that's our own expectations that we don't know where we got it, it doesn't matter. Those high standards oftentimes around per perfectionists in some areas can be overwhelming and incapacitating for that individual. And not only that, the people that surround that individual. And of course, it's not just the individual, this is you know, around families and the idea that it's the same kind of motifs around most of our uh, publications that are out there. This is the one that's, you know, it's, it's uh, um, you know, it's, it, it, if we can't, we'll never be good enough. This idea of perfection of being painful and debilitating, it's kind of a no-win situation. Um, there's a researcher by Pact back in the 1980s who called it a God scum phenomenon. Now you like that for a di dichotomy. When you do something well, you're on top of the world, but it doesn't stay very long and then you start going down and you feel like crap. Sorry, <laughs> scum. There's this dichotomy that most, many perfectionists have. You can do well, but that moment of success or you know, that you can acknowledge your validation, it's not enough and you start going down and now you start worrying about the next thing. And so for many of our perfectionists, they're actually driven by a fear of failure. The idea of doing something not for mastery of material, but not, not to fail. Think of our athletes. How many of you were athletes growing up? No. And that's a big driving force for many of our athletes to do something not because I want to do it, but I don't want to look like a fool in front of my, cla in my classmates or my teammates, among other things. So it's that whole idea of that dichotomous perspective that some perfectionists have that I want to address. But let's talk about just some examples that are out there. This is an idea. Have you ever heard of Prince? <laughs> of course, Prince. It does take a drive to be successful, no matter what we do. And what I mean by success, I'm not talking about success that's like this, where you're an international sensation. Success is however you define it. But there is a drive to do that. And in this case, of course, you've got I'm a musician like Prince and how it was described to him, but it goes beyond that. How many of you are Eagles fans? You know, the late Glenn Fry, right? Glenn Fry, the idea that people describe his obsessive perfectionistic tendencies. Even he says it's no accident. The idea for him would be to continue hammering something that anybody else would say is good enough, just good enough. J G, E, but he would take it one step further. And because of that, of course, because of that drive, you had some of the best music that came out in the 70s and then in the 80s. Again, there is a drive here, but at what cost? 
And sometimes we learn from it. Sometimes we learn from it. So here's one. This is Steve, Steve Jobs. You've heard of him, right? So Steve Jobs, and you know, his perfectionistic tendencies were legion. How he would drive not only himself, but more importantly, those around him to do better and better and better. But it came at a cost. It came at a cost not only to him and his health, but those who loved him the most. So there is this fine line between pushing ourselves, but also how that's being manifested around uh, those who, who love us the most. And that was shown, for example, in this one. And this is Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, self-described, I push and I push from her perspective. And right, there's nothing wrong with that. But from her daughter's perspective, it was a little bit different. The daughter's perspective was this, awfully hard to live with somebody who is a perfectionist. Because oftentimes when a perfectionist is doing what they're doing, they don't just hold their standards to themselves. They expect oftentimes those around them to maintain the same standards. And that's very difficult for those of us, uh, not me, but whoever grew up with parents, for example, who are perfectionists, awfully tough to live with sometimes. Not bad, but tough. So that's one side of it, is all of these negatives. But we don't need to think about these celebrities Let's think about this individual, far less a famous example. The problem with him, unfortunately, was all of his energy was placed on success. And when he placed that much variance, that much um, um, weight on success, remember the God scum? You, you spend a lot of time in the scum and not a lot in grub. In many individuals, if they don't have poor coping skills, they end up doing some things that if they just took a step back, they, they could think about doing other ways. Here's another example. This is Dr. Jonathan Drummond Webb, one of the most amazing guys, because what he did is he specialized in a very uh, type of surgery of heart defects. Not many could do it, and he did. His rate was so successful, 98% success rate, 98% in one of the most difficult surgeries you can have. That's 10 and a half surgeries he would do a week. 98% success rate, but he would focus on the two that he couldn't. It was very difficult to accept mistakes. And as you probably can guess, when you're at that point, at that level where you can't balance it out, those mistakes become unbearable. And again, he did something that was very tragic. So that's one side of looking at one type of perfectionist. But I wanna challenge you on something as we're going forward here. It's not so much the perfectionists. Are there different types of perfectionists? The old way of looking at it was very much what I just showed you in those slides. That was the way that most of us see perfectionism, right? Well, even when we say perfectionist, there's a negative connotation to that. But I want to challenge you. I want to say, uh, you know, let's think about it differently. And I'm just going to give you some take-home ideas and think about this. And it's around these ideas, the idea of striving for something. Let's call that standard. Standards means how high I have my standards. But then let's look at the opposite side of standards, and that's that thing called self-criticism. And that's not a dichotomy. They're related. But the point of it is there are some individuals that really have high standards, but they accept mistakes. They're not as self-critical as others. Now let's go back to your own children. And let's think about that dichotomy, not dichotomy, let's think about that dimension. How many of your children that you're raising your hand about perfectionism have high standards? And when I mean by high standards, we all have high standards in our own way. High standards are beyond what, you know, you, you can compare your child to other children who might be hanging around your child. Are they higher than that? Does that make sense? I don't want to call it abnormally high, but higher than normal, higher than expectation. All right? How many of your children are highly self-critical about their, what they do? Okay. So they beat themselves up. They can't let it go. They perseverate on something. And more importantly, something that we don't think about is that for some of our students with really high self-critical thinking, they don't step outside of their comfort zone. They stay within what they know they can do, what they can master. And that, uh, oftentimes when they step outside of their comfort zone, that's when you start seeing the anxiety and the stress start to increase because they can't master it. So how many of you have children like that? Just pointing it out. Good, good, all right. 
let's take those strivings and that self-criticism and let's put them into two categories. And we're, from now on, that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to use two categories. We're going to call one adaptive, meaning that they can adapt to changes more readily than maladaptive, just for the sake of the term. Maladaptive. So we've got two groups here we're going to be looking at over time. Good? All right. By the way, I've been speaking all afternoon, so I'm not from here, as you can probably tell. I'm from South Dakota. Anybody been to South Dakota? Black Hills? Sioux Falls. Sioux, oh my gosh, Sioux Falls, yes. I live nowhere near there, but I live, <laughs> I live in flat land. And so my, na my no nasal twang, as you can pick up, is annoying me if I talk too much. So please feel free to ask questions as we're going forward. It stops me from talking. All right, so let's talk, let's hold that, hold those two dimensions on here, and let's talk about what might be happening that distinguishes the bind for the maladaptive perfectionist is that those high standards, they have to be continually be achieved. How many of you have st students who might be mastering something and they over-practice? Over and over and over, it's almost like an obsession, right? Um, it, it, yet those efforts are perceived as not likely. They got to keep doing it and it's never good enough. It's always, I, got, I can do one more free throw. I can do one more of this. I can do one more of that. That's the, the kind of the hallmark of the maladaptive perfectionist is that they'll keep practicing, which in our minds is, yes, you want to get better. But there's a point where it's like, you're not getting any, it, the law of diminishing returns. You're not getting a lot of returns from more and more practice. You're just practicing more and more. So that's one thing, and what they're doing is they're, they're not looking at what they're improving upon, they're looking at the continued flaws that they may have as imperceptible to the rest of us as it might be. Now for those of you with young children, this might be difficult to kind of grasp because we're talking with young children. How many opportunities do they have to practice free throws until they're blue in the face? But for those of us who have adolescents, for example, are there situations that you've seen where they have overpracticed, not for the sake of getting better, but for the fact that they're perceiving some flaws that they want to correct and it's never getting any better. It's all around coping. What's happening here is that the distress is increasing. How many of you know when you look at your child, you see the stress levels rise? How many of you can see that? What do you see when their stress levels rise? What are some of the physical characteristics? Body tension. Body tension. Yeah, what, what tenses? Tense Good. Good, perfect. I can feel it in my body. There's a sense. There's a sense like, uh oh, something, something just went left. Got it. Anybody else? Perfect. That's good. I love it. I love it. How about uh, anybody else want to? Con so he over he talks. He doesn't go quiet. He talks. Great. And does, when he talks, does his cadence get faster? Does his voice get louder? Those kind of things. So it may not not just frequency, but what he's doing with his speech. And what is he saying to himself when he's constantly talking? Okay. And how old, by the way, man? Ten. <laughs> it's okay. Eight out of ten. <laughs> Oftentimes, that's good. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Oftentimes, what you will hear is exactly that, but it's also the negative self statements. And it's, I can't do this, or it's like, where did this just come from? Those kind of negative self-statements. And what that is, it's just, it's just a, it's a coping mechanism that's not helpful. And what it actually is doing is it's, ex it's exacerbating their stress levels. I'm going to walk you through what's happening. I'm just kind of giving you a sense. And then we're going to talk about what's happening under the hood, so to speak. When your child, who might, you know, have maladaptive professionists, is under that stress level of performance and it's not going his or her way. So I'm giving you that. And it is hard to change. For example, for, the, for your students, like you're seeing, okay, you're starting to stress out. 
What do you typically do to try to get them to calm down? Good. Does it help? I, sometimes. Sometimes. Good. Good. Perfect. Excellent. Any others? Sleep, eat, and exercise. Sleep, eat, and exercise. Sleep, eat, and exercise. For him. Right. In the moment when he's stressed out, can he do any of those? Or sometimes. Good. Go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, just so you're seeing him. I, I'm not saying I'm saying he he started to increase. You uh, you, you got him to sleep, eat, and exercise. Is he hearing you at that moment, though? Is he hearing these commands? Yeah. Okay, good. How about when your child is speaking and raising and cadence and maybe the self-talk, how do you get him to calm down? If you can. Beautiful. How does he respond? <coughs> you know what? You're right, Ms. Kolak. This is a very educated audience. Very. Because what you're doing is perfect. You're trying to get them to get off of it, right? Get off of what's causing this distress in you, either by distracting or reminding them what they can do to get them off or just reminding them what they're doing. Most of the time, that's not the responses we, I expect from parents. What I res expect is either my voice starts to get louder, so I'm trying to sh overshout them, calm down, that kind of a thing, or I try to ignore it, and that doesn't seem to help. I do a lot of other things that you, you, you do, and that's wonderful. So we're going to focus on what is actually happening when they're under this stress situation. And um, what we want to talk about is this gap between having the high standards. So I'm gonna say this real quickly. It's not the standards, that's not the issue. Having high standards is not an issue. It's can I accept when my standards are not met? That's the gap. The gap between standards and acceptance when my performance doesn't match that standard. That's when you start seeing the distress. It doesn't meet their standards, whatever those standards are. That is the difference between a perfect, adaptive and a maladaptive perfectionist. All right, so. Let's do this. I'm getting my steps in here. Why? How do we determine this? Well, first of all, it's that whole nature-nurture thing. I mean, really, I'm a psychologist. If <laughs> talking with somebody, and they go, what's causing this? You know, if I don't know, I'm just going to pull out, well, it's kind of nature-nurture. You know, they're born with it, and they kind of learn from it. But it really is around this, too. The idea of temperament, for your children that you've said, yeah, they have it, when was the moment that you re realized, you're kind of high-strung here? When was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect age. That's right around the age where you go, okay, we got a, we got a high strung young man here, a young lady here. So there's a temperament issue. They're born with it. That's fine. But the socially prescribed, what we call nurture, that comes from what they get from inputs from outside. Could be from parents, could be from teachers, it could be from anything. Think of the messages that they might be receiving, even unintentionally, where that idea of standards are important. Think grades. I'm not saying that reduce your standards. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, what are the messages, especially if they're temperamentally inclined to have those high standards anyway? What are some of the messages that they might gasp, grasp from others that are feeding into that? Does that make sense? So um, there's a whole bunch of other things that are happening, but it really is, when we think about perfectionism, there's actually, like anything else because of the genome project, there are actually alleles in our genes that we've identified seems to be a culprit, the genetically predisposition for perfectionistic tendencies, especially the maladaptive. But it is really 50-50. It's, okay, even if you're born with that, that means nothing. That just means you're susceptible to that but it's the messages that they often receive that they might be, might be misperceiving. And that's the key we're gonna be talking about because it's all around here. And that's distinguishing this. 
So this is data that we've collected to show you the differences between an, uh, um, an adaptive and a maladaptive and a non-perfectionist. Definition of non-perfectionist is I don't have any standards. My standards are not comparably high. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Nothing wrong with that. So this is an example of data that we have collected through our system. And this is, what, 14,000 students? Just a kind of a breakdown. It's a general sample, matches um, national standards. But what we're looking at here is the stress, anxiety, and depression. And we also measured peer victimization, which I won't show here, hello. But also the resiliency side, because we often forget it's not a one-way street. If a student has resiliency characteristics, these are strengths that a student has, both internally, but also social supports. If I have those, then I'm more able to successfully work through the anxiety or depression, if they're high enough. If they're low, then my anxiety or depression or whatever adversity, that's kind of running the show. Make sense? So, so our resiliency is our, our protective barrier here against the adversity. So what we did is we did this and we measured against those who were identified as adaptive versus those who were maladaptive and those who were not. And it's all around standards and acceptance of performance. So adaptive is your blues, your maladaptive is your dark reds, and your non-perfectionist is your oranges. Hopefully you can see the distinctions. What are you seeing there? Yeah. Yeah, these are mean scores. Means mean life satisfaction. They're all based on a scale of 5. So, or I'm sorry, not a 6. So, life satisfaction mean score for your adaptive. And adaptive are again are those students really high in standards in comparison to others, but also what they're rating in terms of their self-criticism and their acceptance is um, much lower in comparison to a maladaptive, equally high standards, but they have a really hard time accepting occasions when they can't accept, or uh, accepting when their performance doesn't match their standards. That's the definition. And then, again, the non-perfectionists, their standards are comparatively significantly lower than the other two groups. So what you're seeing here is what? Social connections. Yeah. What does that tell you about that? At least from their perspective. Mm -hmm. At least from their perspective. And I'll show you in just a second. But for the other ones, hope, and leadership, positive school experiences, life satisfaction. Let me tell you a little bit about those two, life satisfaction and hope, because we use those terms a lot. Life satisfaction is a very simple concept. And I'll ask you a question. Don't answer it, but I'll ask it. Think about your life in the past six months. How are you doing? And you have to think about all the things that are important to you, and you have to weight all that accordingly. And then that's your global satisfaction score, really. How you see yourself, your future, and your world is global satisfaction. It's the biggest predictor of GPA outside of mastery of material. That's global satisfaction. Um, hope. I've got a goal. But something is, something's blocking my goal. Can I come up with strategies to work around that blockage? Now, high hope students, they can come up with multiple strategies whenever they have a block, and they're going to try one. And if that doesn't work, they're going to go to plan B, and then they're going to go to plan C until one works. And they're motivated to, to pursue that. Low hope students, they usually have one strategy, and if that doesn't work, what happens? They give up. That's the definition of hopelessness, right? It's just simply they haven't really thought of other strategies. <laughs> we, we talked about this this morning with, with the team. Um, think about your life right now, where you are right now, and go back to when you were 18 and you were laying in bed, you were thinking about your life and what you wanted to be. Is this it? What you're doing right now? Is this your plan A? It doesn't have to be. I'm on plan N, I think. I mean, I created a business when I was 55. I know I look like I'm 18. You know, that, ain't, that was not my plan A. But think about where you are right now. It doesn't matter what plan you're in. You had to bust yourself to get to where you are. That was motivation. 
And that's another thing about what we think about hope. It's not just coming up with ideas and strategies. It's the motivation to pursue them. Now look again to hope. What do we see here? Between adaptive and maladaptive and non-perfectionist. They're both higher than the non-perfectionist, right? They can come up with strategies. Now whether those strategies are, <laughs> are good strategies or whether they elicit anxiety, that's a different ball of wax. But what we're seeing here is at least if you've got high standards, that's not a problem in terms of our protective mechanisms. We enjoy life a little bit more in comparison to those who don't have standards. Yeah, whatever. I'll take it as it comes. But at what cost? And that's what I'm looking at here. So if you look at anxiety and depression, who's got the highest levels of both, right? So it does come, it appears, at a cost. And by the way, this is data that we're collecting, but it replicates, you can go into the literature, I'll have, I'm happy to show you any study you want. It shows the same thing. Maladaptive perfectionists fare no, no differently than a, in an adaptive. If you've got high standards, that's great, but it does come at a personal cost to the maladaptive in comparison to um, the adaptive. The other thing is, if you recall back here, where the, um, the, the positive social connections actually favored the students who don't have standards. Think, remember, remember that? All right, so I'm not showing you some data on this one, but there's a hypothesis that we've just recently explored. And um, how many of you are familiar with social network analysis? Not social networking like Facebook, social network analysis. It's very simple. Let's say, for instance, all of us together, we spend a weekend. Let's do it. Let's spend a weekend together. And we have fun. And at the end of that weekend, uh, one of us, a researcher comes in and says, I want you to ask one simple question. Who did you hang out with the most over time during this weekend? And that's a network. That's basically here. That's a network. Each one of us is going to be a network. And I'm going to say, well, I hung around with Ms. Kolak, and I hung around with you, and we hung around, so that's our connection. And maybe, maybe we just, you know, that, and then the other ones are connected like this. Do you see what I'm doing? That's a network map. So there's key aspects of any network, and that's here. Because let's say, for instance, this dyad connects with this individual. That's called a broker in a network, that's called a broker. A broker is very important in any network because the only way information is shared from the network to this is where? That individual. The only way this information here is shared with the network is through that individual. That's called a broker. A broker has a very important position in any social network. That requires a lot of finesse because this dyad probably has different sets of principles, whatever, than this. And this person has to navigate those two. You've got to be cognitively flexible to do that. Who do you think is occupying the position of brokers? Yes. Yeah. It's the non-perfectionist. They're connected more. One of the hypotheses is that they are because they don't have those high standards, and one of the high standards is I've got to belong to this group, right? Think athletes, right? That kind of a thing. Is that they're more cognitively flexible to kind of navigate through these social things. Now, the other thing that we know is this, is that in other studies, we know this. Adaptive and maladaptive both have higher, significantly higher GPA. That shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, those standards are really high, and usually that's shown through uh, GPA. But let's go back to that. <laughs> yes, that's a hypothesis. But if you compare the adaptive versus the maladaptive from the Pierce perspective, not from self reports, but Pierce perspective, and that usually is like measured around who do you hang around with, who do you like, those are kind of studies too. Adaptive perfectionists are significantly higher ratings in terms of likability than the maladaptive. Is that surprising? Why isn't it surprising? I'm, I'm. Well, I mean, usually you decide the standards of your learning, and if um, if the flexibility does not hit a standard, then it just it doesn't it, it 
Yeah. Have you ever hung around somebody who beats themselves up? It's not a good feeling to hang around with somebody like that, especially if they manifest that in behaviors. Ew, slow down, cowboy. I'm going to go over here. I'll, when you calm down, I'll come back, that kind of a thing. So there's, there's multiple reasons why, but I'm just saying there's a social component between these two as well. And then finally, when you think about optimism about future, not so much for young students, because that hasn't been done yet, but for adolescents, especially going into high school, and they think about their future beyond life, beyond high school, and they measure that through optimism. Uh, again, uh, adaptive perfectionism on average and significantly higher reports of optimism than maladaptive. So we got these two distinctions between these two groups. So what might uh, be happening here? The difference seems to be how we're dealing with stress. And when I say stress, I mean perceived stress. Because sometimes, think about it, you know, if our student starts acting up, on the outside I'm thinking, what are you getting so upset about? This is nothing. But again, I'm seeing it from a perspective of an old guy, and I don't see it through their, their eyes, but their eyes is where it's important. So it is perceived stress. But let's think about what's happening. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you this, if I can just erase this. I'm going to show you a picture of the brain, all right? Now, I am very, thank you, it's thank you very much. No. I am, <laughs> before I chose psychology, I went to art school, and so I'm very <laughs> proud of my artistic, so here's the brain. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you want to take a, a photo shot of that, that's fine, but I need some royalties. So this is, <laughs> this is the brain looking this way, right, looking this way. And there's three components of anxiety, there really is. And I'm going to point them out to you, but I'm going to go real quick because what I'm telling you now essentially is a full semester. I'm going to do this in about four minutes. I know, crazy, but I think it could be working. If you take your uh, finger and you go up your spine and where it joins the back of your head, that's a very important part right here. It's the oldest part of our brain, by the way. Every organism has something like that. It's called brain stem. And the brain stem is responsible for things you're not even aware of, but it's keeping you alive. Heart rate, blood pressure, all that stuff is located there, which means if you destroy just this part of your brain, you could still be alive, but you're essentially not alive. That's where it all starts, brain stem. It is the oldest part. As I've said, every organism has this. Every organism, when it's responding to a threat, that's where it starts. There's a little buzz, I'll just say that. And when that happens, every organism is programmed to do one of three things. Let's test this out. When a lion is threatened, what's a lion going to do? Very good. Are you in psychology? Oh, you're very good. Fight. What about a gazelle? Pshew. Now, do you have a, uh, oh, for goodness sakes, possums here. <laughs> so when a possum is threatened? Okay, they freeze, right? They're not going to fight back. I mean, it's very rare you're going to see a, a lion run away unless there's something that overrides that impulse. But that impulse is very p profound. Every organism is programmed. You know what's interesting about human beings is that we can do one of those three. We don't really have a choice, but we temperament, among other things, we, we, have, we can do one of those three. Sometimes we fight, 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 sometimes we flee, sometimes we freeze. It's the same thing, and it starts here. So when a threat comes, that's where it starts, and it's going to go, it's going to buzz. Let's put this into play, play for a second. Let's say you're driving to the school. By the way, when you drove to the school today, is this the first time you drove here? You've drove here many times, right? I'm sure of many, many times. And in fact, you probably drove here so many times that you weren't even thinking about the route you took here. What were you doing instead? Talking, listening to the radio, right? Am I right about this? So, but let's say tomorrow you're driving here, you're dropping somebody off, you're coming to this school, and about a, a block and a half away, you see a red car, and that red car is flying to the intersection where you're going to go. What's the first thing you're going to do? Yeah, you noticed it, because that's something that's out of the ordinary. 
That's the thing about, in this case, a red car going faster. It was out of the ordinary, and you automatically attend to that. What was happening is this. It's happening, right? Now that is a block and a half away, and you have time to think about what you want to do. But what about those moments when that car is coming about 100 feet in front of you, and it's going really fast? You don't have time to think, right? That's where it starts. It doesn't matter. But what happens is that at time one or any of those times when this thing starts to buzz here, it leads to a point. Now, you don't do this at home, but if you take a pencil and you go down about six inches from the top of your head, there is a part of your brain that's about, I'm not kidding you, about a quarter of your thumbnail. It's that small. But that is where your emotions are. Has anybody ever seen the movie Up? No, not Up. Inside Out. Tell me the uh, characters of Inside Out. You did it. You did it. Very good. Very good. The, I love that movie because that is our basic emotions. Our basic emotions, again, is coming from a part of our brain that's very primitive. It can only process those five basic emotions. Yes, we have other emotions, but they're combinations. Think of it as a color palette. So jealousy. What would be a jealousy? What's that combination of? If I get jealous, what, am I, what are the emotions I'm experiencing? Well, one would be anger, right? What's the other one? Fear. fear. Anger and fear. So they're combinations. It happens here. So what's happening is when this thing, whenever there's a threat, that red car, and it automatically links to an emotion. What emotion would you have if you see a red car coming at you? Fear, probably, right? Tomorrow it happens again. Fear, right? But now you've expected it because it happened yesterday. So what's going to happen now tomorrow? What are you going to be expecting? Because it happened two days in a row. Right, you're going to have the same, it won't be as strong, but it's still going to be because you're preparing for it. Tomorrow it's not even a red car. It's not even the same red car. It's, it's, just, it's just a car, but it's coming fast. You're prepared for that. It doesn't matter. You're still going to experience the same emotion. That's the essence of anxiety. Anxiety is a threat to whatever we have, causes this to lead to an emotion, and this is the point. The point is, this emotion, as small and as primitive as it is, it tells this part of our brain, which is this right here, to shut down. Does anybody know what this part is? Frontal lobe, very good. What's that responsible for? It's, it's the boss of everything. The ability to think through problems, to work through it, to overcome. And science tells us when does this frontal lobe fully develop in us as human beings? Mid-20s. Mid-20s. Huh? We've got a ways to go. It's constantly developing, but it's not fully developed at least until the mid-20s. So what is going on here is if, if, if this emotion gets too strong, it literally tells, it sends a message, a chemical message to our frontal lobe, and it says, shut down, don't think. Now we're just a ball of emotions. Sometimes, by the way, that's adaptive. Can you think of any time when that's adaptive? When we can't think? We shouldn't be thinking? We should be re responding? I'm in a jungle, a lion's chasing after me. What's the worst thing I could possibly do at that point? <laughs> should I go here or should I go here? That nanosecond's enough for the lion to eat me. But it's not even that. Think about this. Who's played baseball growing up or a, a fast twitch sport? What is the thing that your coach kept telling you don't do when you're at home plate? Don't think. Because if you're thinking, is this a fast? It's already there. So there are times when it's quite adaptive. You don't want to think, especially if you are in actual positions of threat. Here's the key though. This has no idea what a threat is. It could be physical, it could be psychological. It doesn't matter. And we all have rules. We all have rules that we go with. And I'm going to give you some rules and you tell me if I'm wrong because I have this argument with my wife. This is why you don't want to marry a fellow psychologist because these are the kind of arguments you get into. It's not about leaving your socks out. It's these kind of arguments. There are fundamental universal rules that we all have. All of us have them. And if they're violated, that leads to a threat too. One is the need to belong. 
Think of any time when you've, you have felt that you weren't belonging. Maybe you were at a party and nobody was connecting with you. Did it feel good? Need to belong. Here's another one. Need to be right. How many of you ever, <laughs> you don't need to raise your hand. But one of your arguments could simply be you both feel you're right. The need to be right. The need to look good. I don't want to look good. I don't want to look bad in front of my mother-in-law. That's crazy. And when I do, I don't feel very good about it. Universal rules. My wife argues that there's another one called the need for justice. And justice simply means it's got to be fair. When it's unfair, then that's when we blow. So what I'm saying here is that this is still going to go bzzz, regardless if it's a red car or if it's a violation of our rules. Does that make sense? Now let's talk about this in terms of perfectionism and the rules that our child has, or children have set for themselves and the rules that perhaps unwittingly we've set for them. Hopefully I haven't lost you. You're awfully quiet. Am I that good? No, I'm not that good. I'm not that good. So let's, this is, uh, we just went through this. Threat comes, and I, I've given you a 30,000 foot view of the same thing. What happens during stress, especially if we don't have coping mechanisms, is that when our emotions go um, uh, too much, they send a message and just shut down. The solution is what? Got to keep this thing firing. Got to keep this thing firing. And this is how I'm going to teach you one. Are you ready for this one? Who said they, they try to get their child to breathe? Who was that? Was that you? Perfect, perfect. Oftentimes we do that, and, and I'm sure you do it great, but we don't do it. it. It's not effective. Either the child or any of us, we hyperventilate. <laughs> we don't breathe enough. It, deep breathing doesn't work. So I'm going to have you do this. Can we do this together? And then let's explain. You figure it out why it works, all right? So I want you to relax. Just relax. And what I want you to do is I want you to take a deep breath in your lungs. Don't hold it, but when you get enough breath in your lungs, hold up a finger for me. Not the middle one, but hold up the finger for me. Just get enough and go two more. Make this thing hurt and then let it go. There you go. Two more. Are you feeling it? Let it go. You don't want to hold it. That's dangerous. And it doesn't, have to be sm it doesn't have to be slow. It could be fast. But what you're trying to do is to make this discomfort, make your lungs hurt. And what I want you to do is relax and just make it hurt. Relax everything. Some of your shoulders are up by your ears. <laughs> <laughs> just do it five times or so until you recall. You just relax. If you have a hard time, pretend that the... the air going in your nose, it smells like your favorite incense, or close your eyes and pretend it's a light bulb. And the more air you get in, the brighter the light bulb becomes until when you have so many air, you, the light bulb's so bright you can't think of anything else. If you're finding yourself stressed, take another breath until you're calming yourself down. Try to do it five times. That will give me time to drink my coffee. All right. Why am I making your, by the way, I'm not a sadistic person, so why am I making you make your lungs hurt? What are we trying to do here? Exactly, because when your child is becoming upset, that thing's buzzing, and it's buzzing on whatever that child is perceiving as a threat, right? We have to override that. Now, this part of our brain is very primitive. It can only deal with one threat at a time. So you need to override it by the more proximal threat here. And when you do that, that severs this, and they go back to thinking. That's all you're trying to do. So if you are using breathing, that's the best thing to do when you start to see the eyes or you start to get the, the fast things. Hey, we're just going to stop here. I'm just going to stop. We're going to breathe together. You're not going to talk. You're not going to reason. Because words for many students, remember the need to look good and the need to be right? And if you're trying to calm them down, how are they perceiving that? I'm not, I'm not looking good. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. We're just going to, I'll breathe with you. We're going to do this together. We've done this with so many schools. 
and classrooms do this in the morning with their students. They start the day out just by doing this. Let's start out. And it's just making the lungs hurt. Now, if you're not seeing them do the lungs hurting, no, you got to get it up. By the way, I do this with my children all the time. It may take a couple of minutes. Don't give up until they calm themselves down. And then you can kind of work with them on what's happening here. If you can get them calm, then you can reason with them. It's not the opposite way. Reasoning with them when this is shut down, that's not doing anybody any good, including you, because you just get upset. Not you, but you know what I mean. So that's number one. We also know that stress, these moments, especially for maladaptive, they're under a lot of stress. They may, you may, they may not even tell you because they're constantly under this um, social comparison, right? How am I doing in front of others? They may not, forget, they may not tell you, but it's a, it's a very stressful moment for these. Ongoing social stress is not good, not only for the student, but certainly for you because you're dealing with the down, downstream effects of the stress. So high stress, we think, with maladaptive perfectionism is simply difficulty in threat situations. Number one thing to do in those moments, and I'm not just talking about maladaptive, any time that you find your child, re, you know, stop, just stop it, just stop. Mm. We're gonna breathe so we can calm down so we can figure out what's going on. And then we're gonna teach them something different. We don't treat all perfectionism the same. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start thinking about our own cues to our students. For teachers, one of the things is we really want to preach, and this is wonderful about this school, the idea of mastery. Fear of failure has to turn into the love of learning. You're going to make mistakes. How many of you have ever made a mistake? How many of you have ever made a mistake in front of your child? How many of you have ever made a mistake and admitted in front of your child you made the mistake? <laughs> And that's good if you can do that. But that's oftentimes a one-to-one, -one, right? I made a mistake. Let me tell you, I'm sorry I did that, right? But oftentimes the best learning moments are not those moments. It's the other moments. And I used to call the, I still do, the, the windshield moments. Have you ever had these moments? Think about back when you were an adolescent and maybe you were having difficulties and you're, you're in a car, you're sitting next to your parent and this is the time when you start disclosing because you're both looking at the windshield. You're not looking at each other, right? It's those kind of conversations away from when it happened, sometime down, bringing it up, but you're in a neutral situation. But another one that's very powerful is you made a mistake that's not had nothing to do with your child, but you come home and you describe what happened and how you solved it. And sometimes it's not telling your child, it's having your child overhear you when you're talking to your spouse about what you learned or whatever that third hand thing, does that make sense? You know, research, we do research on all this all the time. What's more powerful for any one of us, directly receiving a compliment or overhearing somebody complimenting us? It's yeah, it's overhearing. So it's the opposite too. When we shape behaviors, that's what we do. Nice job, Jimmy. I really love what you do. That's beautiful and that we need to do that. But oftentimes, you know what Jimmy just did? Jimmy, he helped somebody else who was lying on the floor. He helped them up. That was wonderful. And you just walk away. That thing is more meaningful. It's the same principle here. You know, what I did today and I learned from this. I made a huge mistake. And they can overhear you. So what, they're do what you're doing is you're balancing the idea it's okay to make mistakes. And you're the best social model for that. The other thing, of course, is Socratic questioning. How many of you are familiar with Socratic questioning? Because I don't want to kill you. Good. Socratic questioning. So uh, I got a couple minutes. Familiar with Socrates, right? Socrates, 2,500 years ago, one of the first ones to actually make us challenge our reality, at least according to written record. And, you know, he was this smelly, ugly looking guy. <laughs> he really was. I don't know why I'm laughing and you're not, because I thought it was funny. <laughs> but he would go around and he would be, he's kind of a thorn in people's side because he would always say, Are you sure about that? Here's one. Um, 2,500 years ago, we're standing here. Do you feel yourself move? You know, we are moving. We're moving at, what, 25,000 miles an hour? We just don't feel it. But one of his thought experiments was you, got, you see the sun, and the sun starts in, in, in the day this way, and it comes over us and goes this way. So what's the center of the universe? This rock we live on or the sun? 
and you would base it on your reality and your frame of reference would say, well, I'm standing here, I'm not moving, so the sun is. And Socrates would be the first one to say, you sure about that? But he came up with another one. And this is something I really want you to think about too. Um, it's a man in the cave, and I'm really simplifying this, by the way. So a man in the cave was, you pretend you're born, you're born in the cave, and you're chained to both sides of the cave. What a great way of growing up. You've never seen anybody. You've only seen the wall, and behind you has always been this perpetual fire, casting your shadow on the wall. And one day I come in. You don't see me because I'm behind you, and I say, tell me what you look like. How are you, what are you going to base it on? So describe what you look like. All right, so describe it. What do you look like? Well, what do you do your shadow? Describe your shadow. Ugly, misshapen, gross, right? And then I do something really crazy. I pop a mirror in front of you, and I say, what do you look like? Now what are you going to base your frame of reference on? Most of the time when we create these rules, it's our frame of reference. Whether it's true, whether it's false, that's for us as parents to help them understand. That's Socratic questioning. And it's very simple. Weigh the evidence. And the big one is this. Uh, when you get them to calm down, remember when I said they usually say negative self-statements? Don't let those self-statements slide. No, we're going to talk about the self-statement. I can't do anything right. Let's put this one in. I can't do, have, is this new for you? You've never heard this one before? I can't do anything right? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> I can't do anything right. Oh my gosh, my writing. All right, the thing you do is, to, uh, whoa, let's stop this. All right, let's do this. And that's called evidence for. All right, I'm going to feed into this one. Tell me when you can't do anything right. Give me those times. You're having a discussion with them, but you're, you're kind of leaning into it. Tell me. I can't do anything right. That's really powerful. That's a strong statement, isn't it? That's the shadow talking. All right. Can you guys give me some examples of when that would happen? I can't do anything right. Anything? You're doing it. That's Socratic questioning. So, whereas my other daughter is like the chatty, happy, like super, like goes on to other entities, and it, like anyway. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. But you did it. That's exactly what you're doing. What you don't want—not you, but what a person doesn't want to do—is to either feed into it. Oh, come on! It's not that bad. That doesn't engage the frontal lobe. Remember, critical thinking is the biggest one. If they're thinking through this, that means this is engaged. This is exactly where you want them to be. They're solving their own problem. You're not solving it for them. I'm talk not talking about young children, although this can be used for young children too. The idea is if you pick up those never, I never, I can't, you know, those kind of ugly thoughts, whoa, we're going to stop here. First of all, let's breathe. Let's just calm down here. All right, let's talk about this thing. I can't do anything right. I'm a horrible person, whatever we want to call it. Tell me what this means. And you're weighing the evidence. That's all you're doing. The evidence for, I can't do anything right. They might give you a couple. And you can always challenge that. But if you're going to do evidence for, what's the next thing you're going to do after evidence for? Evidence, that's the beautiful part. That is the beautiful part. Because what you're teaching them is a life skill. Because what's happening now is you've given them every opportunity to kind of feed that fire, that rule, whatever they have. I can't do anything right. Fine, we're going to go through it. And you're going to find you probably have one. <laughs> and then you're going to go to evidence against. All right, now tell me when that's not, not right. What are some times that you did something right? And what you're going to find 
because they do things right. It just doesn't get into that little filter of theirs. That is Socratic questioning. Now, we've been talking about how you can work with your child, but I'm encouraging you to think that way, too. I know it's crazy, but you can. And you do. You just don't recognize when you do it. Whenever you beat yourself up, especially when you're beating yourself up, and even if you don't ver verbally say, I'm beating myself up, they're going to find it. Stop, take a step back. Take a breath in yourself. And just do this little simple exercise, Socratic questioning. And what you're going to find is through evidence against that's going to balance that thought. And if you can balance that thought, that's going to even out your emotions. Remember the whole goal for a maladaptive perfectionist, especially when they're beating themselves up, it's not to out with them and it's not to kind of go, it'll be okay. It's more about keeping this frontal lobe going and that's how you do it. All right, let's talk about you. <laughs> and I'm not asking you to answer, but these are the questions that I often ask when I'm working with families of maladaptive perfectionists. You know, what makes you stressed? I asked you a question, if you remember at the beginning. Do you know what your child is doing that you can pick up, pick up that they're stressed? Let's flip it. Do you know what you show to your child when you are stressed? This is a little experiment. You can either do it or you can't. Write down everything that you think you show and then go to your child and ask them, when I'm stressed, how do you know I'm stressed? And let's see if that's, you got that 100% right. It's amazing what they pick up. My brother and I used to have this little game. Let's take off my dad and let's see how far his little vein in his forehead could pop out. He never knew we would do that. Yeah, we were that kind of kids. So what makes you stress and how do you project that out? And sometimes what they give you back is really insightful on your part. Here's another one, though. Again, think of times when you failed to meet your own expectations or standards or violated one of those rules that we've talked about. How did you react yourselves? Because you're the social model. I'm not, I'm just saying, awareness is the key. And here's one of the awareness that we're going to do is the question around your own motivations. Are you motivated to learn from something and to accept mistakes? Or is it more about avoiding failure? and not showing your warts. Because if you're not, not you, if a parent is afraid to do that for a number of reasons, you can be darn sure that that's extended down to the, parent, to the child, because it's not safe. I'm going to leave you with this. You can do this right here if you want. This is a standard, what we call, um, it's called the almost perfect scale. It's, it's used. It's used worldwide. And as you can see here, there's rating scales here. And go ahead, if it's, it's only eight items, if you won't, wouldn't mind, and give yourself for each item, rate yourself on each one. And I'll give you a, a minute to do it if you want. This is not a diagnostic tool, by the way. That's not what this is for. I'll give you a minute. And let me know when you want me to move forward. Does Terrace Metrics have to donate to get a new whiteboard? <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. So if you notice, there are differences, right? One, three, five, seven, that's your standards. Two, four, six, and eight, that's what we call performance. Are you able to accept? So what we have here is go ahead and add up your items for one, three, five, and seven, and do the same for your discrepancy, the discrepancy between your standards and what happens when you don't meet them. If your standards are greater or equal to the total score of 24, you've got good high standards. If your discrepancy is greater or equal to 14, that means that 
there are times when you have a hard time accepting that. And again, the idea is think about how does that emanate out? If your discrepancy, if your standards are high, if your discrepancy is lower than 14, that means you have a, a good grasp. You're not always going to accept when it doesn't go your way. That's, that's not human nature, but you have a good balance of that. You're able to kind of moderate your emotions and how you respond to failure if it, it should have happened in your eyes. <laughs> I saw that look. <laughs> can you redo it? <laughs> you can do it as many times as you want until you get it right. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. And then finally, if you are if your standards are less than twenty-four, you're just a non perfectionist. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember the social components, the social benefits of this, at least in many respects, is it's not a bad thing sometimes just to say, forget it. And it's all contextual. There are most of the time we have really high standards in certain domains and maybe not so high standards in other domains. The quality of a, the product of a maladaptive is they have high standards in every domain. And that's another thing that we can work with our maladaptive perfectionists is to pick and choose where you want your standards to be set that high. And then the other ones, it's okay to fail. And the best way of doing that is to have your child start something new they've never done before. How many of your children play an instrument, a musical instrument? So not, I don't see a lot of them. That's a classic example of getting your child to do something and for the maladaptive, they don't want to do it, right? It's outside. But the goal here is to have them do it and you're working with them because they're going to fail and you're there to help process during, they'll never get this right, you know, that kind of a thing. Really? Let's talk about this. So that's a, a wonderful way of doing that. We have curriculum around this that we can have for you as well. Um, we have curriculum for adults around what can we do to not only, I'm not kidding you, get our child to fail. We're going to force them to fail. I know it's crazy, but through our guidance, they're going to learn it's not the end of the world to fail. You've learned something through that. I really went along. I spent a lot of time and I hope this was beneficial and worthwhile for you. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Parent University. We'll see you next time.